Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and good evening. And thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Randall Kennedy, presenting The Strange Career of a Troublesome Word. Through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our growing digital community during these challenging times. Thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and also the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Uh, our 2022 events calendar is like going strong um, and it appears on our website at harvard.com slash events where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. Uh, after this introduction, it will drop a link in the chat to order a copy of the book. Uh, your purchases make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. This evening's event will include some time for your questions. If you have a question for Professor Kennedy at any time during the talk tonight, um, you can go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Uh, this event also has closed captioning available. Um, depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking the closed caption live transcript button on your screen, um, but it is available. Uh, and finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, lo these many months, uh, technical issues might arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly, and we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Randall Kennedy is the Michael R. Klein Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, where he is a noted expert on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations. He served as a law clerk for Judge J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals and for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the United States Supreme Court. He's the author of numerous books, including last year's Much Lauded, Say It Loud, on race, law, history, and culture. Tonight, he's joining us with a reissue of one of his most celebrated books on the 20th anniversary of his publication. Uh, earlier, I was looking back on some of the coverage from the initial release, and I was struck by this review from Tasha Robinson of the AV Club. The public controversy over Randall Kennedy's new book began months before it was even published. The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Globe, and others devoted lengthy, high-profile articles to Kennedy's politics and thesis. Blame the book's title. If it had been called the N-word, the media's preferred euphemism for what Kennedy calls the paradigm paradigmatic slur, the debate over the Harvard Law School professor's latest would certainly have been less opprobrious and self-conscious. But part of Kennedy's intention with the book was to get readers to address their knee-jerk reactions to the titular epithet, which is harder to do when they're trying to pretend it doesn't exist. For all the exploitive, confrontational qualities of its title, this is a gentle, non-inflammatory, even-keeled book. His willingness to face the ugliness of the word in a lengthy series of riveting, horrifying stories and examples and still defend it against a total ban is noteworthy. And it may be the most daring thing for reasons that go far beyond the aggressive title. Today, Kennedy's book may be more urgent than ever as books that depict, depict, depict diversity are being banned from public libraries and a white podcast host who felt comfortable enough with this troublesome word to use it in dozens of episodes now faces a public reckoning. The updated edition of Professor Ken that Professor Kennedy shares with us tonight includes a brand new introduction that brings the book fully into the 21st century and addresses how American culture continues to wrestle with this troublesome word. And so now I am pleased to turn things over to tonight's speaker. Oh, a little Zoom issue here myself. And uh, Professor Kennedy, in just a second, the uh, platform will be yours here. Sorry about this, I have a little video issue. Oh dear, I'll just... There we go. Sorry about that. My my deepest apologies. There you go. Good luck. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for the generous introduction. And um, I'd like to I'd like to begin by uh, expressing my 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 gratitude and beyond gratitude, my admiration for the the Harvard Bookstore. It. Uh, has been a home away from home for me for many, many years. I've spent many hours in that bookstore. Uh, I've gone to uh, sessions like this and very much uh, enjoyed learning from all sorts of authors. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be here. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful 
that the uh, bookstore is sponsoring this event and events like it. So um, let me say that um, about 22 years ago, I was uh, in my office thinking about lectures. What, what, what might make for interesting lectures? And um, a word popped into my mind, N-I-G-G-E-R, nigger. It's a word that I'd grown up with, thoroughly familiar with. And I thought to myself, where'd that word come from? You know, I've, I've been the target of the word. I've used the word. I've heard the word used in all sorts of different ways. Where did it come from? So I remember running up from my office to the uh, reference room at the law school library, going to the Oxford English Dictionary, looking it up. You know, what's the etymology of the word? Where, where, where did it come from? And the Oxford English Dictionary says, well, we think that it, it derives from the Latin word for, you know, black, N-I-G-E-R. And then they, they sort of gave other examples, and it was, a, it was a quite long entry. And so, I, you know, I, I read it, and then I um, went back to my, my office, and I went to LexisNexis and put in directions and basically said, I want to see a citation for every federal court case in which the word N-I-G-G-E-R appears. And then I just sat back and you know, waited to see what would happen. Thousands of cases came up. And that sort of struck me. Um, and then I did the same thing for state courts. And again, just you know, just re lots and lots and lots of, of cases. And that's what really grabbed my attention. And what grabbed my attention was the way in which this word uh, appeared in so many cases. And then I just started reading the cases and reading the way in which this word figured in the law. Um, and then just one thing led to another. I just kept day after day after day after day after day reading cases. Then I started thinking, well, you know, what about literature? Are there literary, you know, where, where does this, where does the word, word appear in literature? Um, so I started reading, you know, short stories and novels. It was fairly easy. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, there are, there, there are plenty of stories where the word appears in the title. Uh, then I started looking for various controversies with respect to the usage of this term in, uh, in, 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 in fiction, in uh, the lyrics to, to songs. And then I just started keeping an eye out for commentary about uh, this term. And after a while, I just, you know, I just sort of gathered all this material together, and then I started writing lectures. And this book became, uh, was, was really a compilation of lectures. And I'll, I'll, I'll walk through the four. There were four lectures that um, constituted the bulk of this book nigger, the strange career of a troublesome word. Uh, chapter one is probably the least, the, the, the first two chapters are not all that controversial. Uh, chapter one is called the protean inward. And in that chapter, I, um, I talk about the history of the word. I talk, for instance, about the way in which people who studied the word note that it's not altogether clear when it became a slur. It did, we know that it became a slur. It was, it was understood uh, as a slur uh, early, by, by early in the uh, 19th century. But how it became a slur, as opposed to just, you know, a description, no one really knows. 
And so I talked about the, you know, the history of, 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 of the term. And in that first chapter, I mainly focused on the way in which the term has been used to demean, has been used to um, deride, has been used to terrorize. And I gave example after example after example of the way this word has been used to put down black people. And um, again, I, you know, in, in detail, I, I, I did this with some detail and I was, I, I wanted to bring home to the reader the awfulness uh, of the, um, uh, the, the awfulness of the way in which this word has often been used uh, in American history. I wanted to show that this is a word that has often had blood literally dripping off of it. I wanted to bring home to the reader the way in which this word has been part of the soundtrack of some of the most atrocious um, examples of racial mistreatment. And so that, that, that's really the, that was really the main purpose of, uh, of chapter one. Chapter two is called Nigger in Court. And what I wanted to do there was to show the way in which this term has generated all sorts of legal controversies. One controversy, I mean, there, there are many, there are many, 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 but you know, one is one of the most famous murder trials in uh, American history, the uh, trial in which uh, the state of California charged O.J. Simpson with murder. And uh, some of you may recall that a very important part of that trial had to do with the infamous N-word because there was a police officer who um, said that uh, he had found incriminating evidence uh, on uh, O.J. Simpson. And uh, the defense lawyers asked this, uh, this uh, officer, well, there's, 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 there's a rumor out that you, know, you have used the, that you like using the N-word, that you've used it many, many, many times. Have you ever used it? And he said, no. He ref you know, I absolutely not. Well, it turned out that there was there was tapes of this officer using the word, not once, not twice, not three times, many, many times. And the one question was, well, were these tapes going to be played for the jury? You know, a question of evidence. And so, you know, there was a lot of legal wrangling about would this would allowing the jury to hear this word being used by this officer would that be just too prejudicial um and there, there are many um legal controversies uh that surround the use of this word uh if you have a case for instance if somebody brings a case saying that uh, uh, their rights under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act have been violated because of a hostile workplace. Well, wh why do you say it's a hostile workplace? Well, the supervisor has used the infamous N-word. Well, you know, when this sort of thing is litigated, questions come up, well, how many times did he use it? Did he just use it one time? Did he just use it two times? Does he use it pervasively? At what point does the use of the N-word become uh, an you know, unwelcome, a, 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 a hostile workplace for purposes of Title VII? And there are many other sorts of um, uh, uh, legal controversies, and that's the subject of, 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 the, of the second chapter. The third chapter of the book is by far the most controversial. The third chapter of the book is called Pitfalls in Fighting Nigger, Perils of Deception, Censoriousness, and Excessive Anger. And it's in this chapter that I say that, you know, um, 
we know that this is a word that has been used in terrible ways, but isn't it also the case that this word has been put to other uses? So for instance, Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory titled his first memoir, Nigger, a memoir. Well, was Dick Gregory engaging in some sort of racist enterprise? Uh, or was he trying to use this term in an anti-racist fashion? Um, Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn. The infamous N-word appears hundreds of times. Um, over 200 times. I don't think it reaches 300, but over 200 times. Racism. What about, uh, what about James Baldwin? What about Toni Morrison? What about Martin Luther King Jr. in Letter from a Birmingham Jail, in which he talks about the significance of the infamous N-word? Racism. What about Richard Pryor? Um, his great comedy album, That Nigger's Crazy, racism. Um, I make the argument, no. Um, one of the things that makes this word such an interesting word to study is the way in which it's been put to all sorts of different uses. Yes, we need to you know, keep fully in mind the racist use of the word, but hasn't this word been deployed in other ways? And when it is deployed in other ways, is it proper, is it wise, is it a good thing to throw the book at people who have deployed this word in not what I would view as non-racist ways? Well, that generated lots of controversy. And what really took the cake for you know, some readers was I uh, took, the, took the position that uh, white people or anybody could deploy the N-word in non-racist fashion and in a fashion that would not generate a protest from me. And there were lots of people who took exception to that. And when I subsided in a minute, we can go further into that if folks would like to pursue it. Um, the final chapter of the, of the book is called, How Are We Doing with Nigger? And I'm just going to read you the last, I'm going to read you the last sentence of the book. The last sentence of the book is, for good, for bad and for good, Nigger is destined to remain with us for many years to come. A reminder of the ironies and dilemmas, the tragedies and glories of the American experience. Now, that's the end of, of the book. And um, just, I guess, one more thing, because this is the, the occasion for this session, is the printing of a 20, 20th anniversary edition of my book with a new introduction by me. And uh, at the end of the, my new introduction, I repeat what I said before. I repeat that for bad and for good, nigger is destined to remain with us for many years to come a reminder of the ironies and dilemmas, the tragedies and glories of the American experience. I don't think that has changed in 20 years. And frankly, I don't think it will change in the next 20 years. Um, I'm going to subside there. And uh, I'm happy to take on questions, comments, and by all means, objections. I would assume that, you know, dealing with a subject like this, there would probably be objections. And I'm happy to take on all of that. So, uh, what do we, any questions? I can warm things up. I can, you know, I've, I've been asked lots of questions about this, this book. 
uh, one question that folks have asked me is, well, you know, what have been the personal consequences for me in writing this book? And there have been many. I mean, I've written, I've written a number of, of, of books, but none of the books I've written have generated as many interesting, um, as many interesting experiences as were generated by the writing of this book. So a couple of experiences. First of all, I've never been put in physical danger by any of my other books, but this one has put me in physical danger. Um, there have been a couple of times at bookstores where people have gotten really quite riled up and have uh, tried to uh, grab me or uh, otherwise hurt me. Uh, that was rather alarming. Um, that's one. Uh, another upshot of this book has had to it comes from um, being asked to be an expert witness. I've been asked to be an expert witness in uh, in uh, labor arbitrations. I've been asked to be an expert witness in um, you know in in, in various sorts of uh, civil suits. I've also been asked to be an expert witness in um, serious criminal trials. So there was a case in Florida, terrible case, in which a man um, assaulted another man and um, it was a case initially, I think, of attempted murder. I think it became murder because I think the man who was assaulted died. And the authorities in Florida, uh, I think, wanted to enhance the penalty and wanted to portray this as a, a hate crime because when the crime was committed, the perpetrator used the infamous N-word. And then later at trial, the defense was, well, he wasn't using the word as a slur. He, this guy is a big fan of hip hop and he was just using the term in the way in which it is often used by, in, in, in hip hop culture. That was the claim. Now, um, there were various transcripts made of this defendant's conversations while he was in jail awaiting trial. And I was asked to take a look at the transcripts and to issue an opinion as to the way in which he was using the infamous N-word. So that, was, that was a case in which I was a, was a, was a witness for the, he called by, an expert witness called by the prosecution. There was a case in New York City in which uh, I was called by um, the defense. It was a terrible case of uh, some uh, youngsters, teenagers, who um, assaulted a man. And uh, in, the, um, in the assault, they used the infamous N-word. And they too were, they, the, the, the authorities tried to um, enhance the, um, uh, the penalty, penalties against them on the grounds that they were engaged in um, basically a hate crime. And the defense simply, the defense wanted to make the jury aware of the various uses to which this word can be put. And I was asked to basically take the witness stand and simply repeat on the witness stand what I had written in my book. And I, I, I did that. So, and I found it very interesting. So this is a, this, this book has, 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 like I said, had some very interesting consequences for me. Uh, people have asked me, have, have I been on the receiving end of the infamous N-word? In, in have, have I been called nigger? And the answer is yes. Yes. At various stages of my life, I have been called nigger. In the, in the book, I talk about 
how um, different people respond to being targeted by uh, this word. So I, I, I give the example of how I remember when I was in elementary school, I got in a, I was uh, somebody at my elementary school called me nigger and um, I fought the person after school. When I came home at dinner time, I was asked, you know, my parents said, well, you know, have a good day. You know, anything interesting happened? And I said, yes, yeah, an interesting thing did happen. Uh, somebody called me this and, you know, I fought him after school. And my parents viewed this in totally different ways. My mother was very angry at my having gotten at my having gotten in a fight. And you know her her message was, you know, getting in fights like that very dangerous, and uh, you should have ignored it. Uh, you know, don't don't get don't don't get in fights over over this. You should you know be above it. My father's advice was totally the opposite. I mean, he said, you, you did the right thing. And, uh, you know, it was just one person, right? He said, yeah. I said, yeah, it was just one person. He said, yeah, because if it's, if it's more than one person, uh, you might have to look around and, you know, find a, you know, a brick or a bottle or, you know, or a stick or something and go to town on them. But I, I thought it was very interesting. I mean, again, my parents had such different responses to, how to how to how to negotiate life in the face of the infamous inward. Um, over the um, over the course the past twenty years, I've been um, asked about the, the the writing of this book, and there've been there've been. There have been many people who, uh, strangers and friends of mine, who have expressed disquiet about one particular uh, part of the book, and that, that's the title. So when the book came out 20 years ago, there were a number of people who really took ob 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 objection to the title of my book and, and the the way that the publisher, the way that the publisher set forth the book. So, this is the book twenty years ago, the 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 paperback version. This is the the new version. Both versions have N I G G E R on the title, you know, and on the on the on the on the in the front of the book. And so I've had people say, "This is terrible." You're going to have this word, this book, in bookstores all across the United States. This is just sensationalism on your part. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself. This is sensationalism. And you know, I felt like, well, okay, that's a that's a that's a strong criticism. You know, what what do, what do I say in response? And what I say in response is this. Um, I spent a lot of time writing the uh, lectures that constitute this book. I spent a lot of time, you know, revised them and tested them out, and, you know, a lot of time, a lot of energy. And when I made them into a book, um, I wanted to, um, I wanted people to read the book. You know, I wanted people to read the book. And getting people, getting people's attention is a tough thing. I mean, if you go into the Harvard bookstore, as soon as you go into the Harvard bookstore, as soon as you go in, there are hundreds of books in which the author is silently saying, Look at me. Look at look at my handiwork. Please just pick up the book. Just take a look at the title. Just read the first sentence. 
That's why a lot of you know a lot of time and attention goes into the creation of titles, the creation of that first sentence, that first paragraph. A lot of time and attention goes into trying to grab the reader's attention. Well, was I trying to grab readers' attention? Yes, absolutely, sure I was. Um, just like I'm trying to grab and keep readers' attention in the you know topic sentences and in the paragraphs and the, you know everything I'm doing, I'm trying to grab and keep readers' attention. If you want to call that sensationalism, okay, fine. Uh, if, if that's if that's sensationalism, then um, I'm uh, I'm guilty of sensationalism. I, I, don't, I don't I don't feel I don't feel bad about that. People have asked me whether I've encountered trouble in the book selling marketplace. I'm happy to say that no, I haven't. So as far as I know, I do know that the book when I sent the book in to uh, my editor at Pantheon Books, I do know that within the, within the, I, I later learned, nobody, nobody, you know, nobody in the publishing house said anything to me about it, but I, I later learned that it was quite controversial. There were some people in the publishing house that, you know, really didn't think it would be a good idea for them to publish a book with this, um, uh, you know, title. Um, but generally speaking, no, I haven't encountered uh, problems with, you know, with, with, with booksellers. When the book first came out, I did write a letter that some booksellers put right next to my book explaining you know, what I was, you know, trying to accomplish. But generally speaking, no, I haven't encountered many problems. Um, let's see here. What is the biggest change you've seen in how the public views the N-word since publishing this book? You know, I haven't seen a whole lot of change. Um, one quite striking thing, I suppose, is that I remember in the, in the, in the, when I wrote the book 20 years ago, I said that no ambitious politician with national ambitions would get close to any use of this word. And I talked about how, you know, it, there, there, was a, there was sort of a kerfluffle when I think it was uh, George Bush, he was running, George Bush the Younger was running for president and there was a microphone on and, um, and um, he referred to some journalists in a very derogatory way. He did not, not no ethnic or racial slur, he just Defer to refer to him in a very derogatory way, and and you know there was some discussion about that. I said, you know, there was discussion about it, but just suppose he had used the N word, that would have been a very different thing. That would have been a big big deal. And so I made I made the claim, you know, 20 years ago, no national politician would get close to you know using this word. Well. Um, when, um, when Donald Trump was president of the United States, there was talk, never, you know, do we have proof positive? No, but there were allegations that he used the word. You know what happened? It was a yawn. He said, no, it's not true. He said that sort of half-heartedly. And frankly, um, standards have been driven down so much by Donald Trump that actually it really wasn't much of a story. I bet that many millions of people thought, you know, yeah, it's probably true. But people just sort of shrugged. Um, I do think that uh, I've, I've had to revise and uh, my view. 
I think it is possible, and this is a terrible commentary on the state of political life in the United States, but I think it's true. Yeah, unfortunately, you can be a national politician and um, have used, not just mentioned, used this word in the old fashioned way and still be quite influential. That is a very damning thing to say, but I think it is a true thing to say. Um, The, um, in this era of book bannings, have there been attempts to ban the book? Ban my book? I don't know if there have been every, let me put it like this. Um, I don't think, I don't know of uh, cases in which um, uh, you know, legislatures have named my book as a book that you know ought to be put on put on the you know ought to be prohibited. Um, I do know that I mean every year there are teachers that get in trouble who have used my book. Every year in the United States, there's some teacher somewhere who loses his or her job because they excerpt a part of my book, give it out to their class, and have a discussion. And what usually happens is uh, a parent learns of this, maybe reads it, thinks that this is awful, that the word itself is being even mentioned in class, and uh, demands that disciplinary action be taken against the teacher. And all too often, uh, principals and other people in positions of authority uh, are very afraid of the, uh, you know, the parents and, uh, you know, just basically abandon the teacher and discipline the teacher. That happens every year. Um, I find myself writing letters to school boards, writing letters to principals, writing letters to other authorities, uh, but that does uh, that does uh, happen. Here's a um, a um, a question from someone whom I know. Thank you very much. It says, "Congratulations on the 20th anniversary of your significant, thoughtful book." Appreciate the plug. You've spoken about your experience of being called the word nigger. My question is. How do, you, you, how do you use the word nigger in both your professional life and in your personal life? Also, how did the great Justice Marshall use the word? Did his usage overlap with your own? Um, yes, I've used the word in a variety of ways. I mean, obviously I've written a you know, I've deployed the word to you to, to, to write a book about it. But that's not what you're really asking. You, what you're really asking is, have I used the word not just as a subject of examination, but have I personally used the word in the way that some people object to? And the answer is yes. So, for instance, have I used the word as a term of endearment? As in, good to see you, my nigga. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And I, you know, and, I, and, and do, do I feel badly about that? No, I don't feel badly about that. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a bad thing. Do I use the word, do I use the word to demean anyone? Do I use the word to, um, uh, to you know, to do what? Do I 
Do I use the word as a weapon? No, I don't use the word as a weapon, and I don't think it ought to be used as a weapon. Um, unless it's being used as a weapon against racism. But uh, do I use, you know, have I used the word in various ways? In my classes, in my classes, I teach classes on race relations law. I have no compunction whatsoever about reading from some document that contains the word nigger or reading uh, you know, testimony that contains this word. Uh, I, no compunction whatsoever. Now, there are teachers in other places who have gotten in considerable trouble. There was a teacher at uh, Stanford Law School, oh, I think it's about a year and a half ago. He um, was reading something that was attributed to, well, one of the founding fathers, Patrick Henry, contained the infamous N-word, and there were students who complained about this professor airing the word. He, he, it wasn't his language, he was just quoting. But they, you know, there were, there, were, there, were, there were students who complained about that. And the administration of the school uh, chided the professor. And indeed, the professor apologized later. Um, I don't think that the administration of the school ought to have chided the professor. I don't think that the professor should have should have apologized. I don't think there was anything to apologize for. And uh, again, do I, you know, uh, repeat the word? Yeah, sure I do. And I have no compunction about it. You asked about Justice Marshall. Justice Marshall was a wonderful storyteller. And did the word nigger appear in stories told by Justice Marshall? Answer, yes, absolutely. And I don't think that he would have been, I think he would have found it odd if someone had said, gosh, uh, you know, do you feel bad about the story that you just told in which you use the term nigger? Uh, some of the stories he told, the whole purpose of the story was to underline the various ways in which this word has been used. Um, others, let's see. Um, you know, this word has been, well, one question has to do with whites, white people and the use of this word. You know, can white people, should, should, should anybody, should there be differences in approach based on the racial identity of a speaker or a performer or for that matter a teacher should there be should 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 i be privileged i'm black should i be privileged to talk about this word examine this word deal with this word in certain ways uh, and get a pass, so to speak, because I'm black? Should I be privileged? Should my blackness give me a privilege in dealing with this word? My answer is no. No. I don't, I, I shouldn't, I, you know, I, I reject, I reject uh, that racial privilege. I view myself as a scholar, an intellectual, a commentator, and if you know, if and if, if if a white person is a scholar, is an intellectual, is a commentator, and a white person uh, is dealing with, let's say, you know, the, 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 let's suppose that we are having a symposium on taboo expression. Um, and let's suppose that the white person has done a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, and wants to 
talk about this word as taboo expression. Should this person be able to do that? Absolutely, of course the person should be able to do it. I'm wholly against the drawing of racial boundaries in the realm of culture. I can talk about this subject, but my colleague who is white cannot. No, we, should, we ought not have that. Uh, the realm of culture is open to all. And what we should do is, well, let's make an assessment. You know, did this person say something insightful? Did this person uh, explore this subject in a, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a deep way, in an illuminating way? If they did, good. And does it matter as far as I'm concerned, you know, what, what their race is, what their nationality is, what their gender is, what their sexual orientation is, et cetera, et cetera. Those, those are all status categories, which insofar as, you know, uh, grappling with culture, as far as I'm concerned, that, that's beside the point. What, what matters is what does one do what does what, what what does one do with their experience, with their knowledge, if one, you know, the 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 status that you bring, uh, you know, maybe maybe because of your status, you've had the benefit or the potential benefit, the potential benefit of certain experiences. So, for instance, like I said earlier, I've been called nigger. All right, well, that's an experience. Question, what do I do with that experience? There are a lot of people who have experiences and you know don't, don't do much with it. They have an experience, fine. It's potentially enlightening, but they don't make anything of it. You know, they have an experience and they talk about it and it's totally boring. Um, you could have somebody who has not had an experience themselves. You know, they haven't been called nigger, let's say. But uh, they write about the subject in a way that might be very, you know, very enlightening. So, you know, again, in my view, um, people ought not be prohibited from exploring something uh, because of uh, uh, b b because of you know their um, their status. Question: A recent episode: Black students gather in a high school hallway at the end of the school day, and in their lively talk, the N word is a mainstay. A white school staff person whose office was very close by put a sign outside the office door stating something like, this is a no inward zone. They had approached the black principal who had agreed with the sign. The students continued to use the word. There was no change. A black staff member came by the office to persuade taking down the sign because it was offensive to the students coming from a white person. Professor, what is your understanding of a situation like this? Well, I just, I, I, okay, I, I preempted the question. Um, coming from a white person, as far as I'm concerned, what are you talking about coming from a white person? The question is, what does one think of the sign? Um, and by the way, I don't have a problem with, um, different people expressing different views about the inward. So um, I have people whom I deeply respect, deeply respect, who take the position that they are never going to use the word and they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. So I've talked, I've had, I have friends who, you know, they, it's, it's understood. Um, I, and I, I won't use, I won't repeat the word. I won't enunciate the word fully in their presence. I don't have, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I once went on a radio show. It was a call-in show. And um, 
early in the morning. So early in the morning show was from Detroit, Michigan. And right before going on, right before going on, the person, the, you know, the, the person whose show I was going on says, you know, we have a, a, uh, a policy, a very strict policy at the station. You cannot say the word nigger. And I said, well, gosh, you know, it would have been helpful for you to have told me that, you know, a little bit earlier. And I had to make a decision right then on the, you know, right on the spot, because I thought, I thought for a moment, of canceling the interview because after all if I was going to be you know if I was going to follow their rules I was not going to be able to mention the title of my book and then I thought nah, go on go on and I did and I stuck by their by their rules I did I never fully enunciated the word nigger I just you know I said in word um, the strange career, but troublesome word. Um, we had a perfectly, I was on for an hour. We had a perfectly good discussion. I, uh, challenged the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the radios, um, the radio stations policy, but we had a perfectly good discussion. I mean, you know, there is a place for euphemism. Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't demand that everybody, use this word and I fully understand why some people really just don't want to, you know, just their, their, their position is that, you know, they're, they're never going to use it. They don't want to hear it. I disagree with them, but, uh, you know, I, I, I understand, I understand, uh, where they are, uh, you know, where they are coming from person wants to know what about this word in comparison with other words that have um, been uh, you know that are that are used as slurs the American language is full of derogatory ethnic and racial terms I mean you go go take a look at um, H.L. Mencken's wonderful book, The American Language, he's got a big chapter all about slurs. And, you know, there, there are many slurs. The infamous N-word, however, is singular. Um, it is the slur, when it is used as a slur, it is the slur against which other slurs are, 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 um, are measured. It is the slur that has given rise to, you know, many analogies, you know, woman, women as niggers, Palestinians as niggers, Irish as the niggers of Europe. I mean, so this, this particular term has been particularly, you know, generative. One way in which, if, if I were going to try to give some sort of quantitative substantiation to my, my, my claim that this is a quite singular slur, again, if you go to, um, if, you, if you take a look at court records, if you go to Lexus Nexus and say, okay, I want court cases in which this word appears. You'll get a certain number of cases. Then you can put in other terms. You can put in, let's say, kike. You can put in gook. You can put in chink. You can put in honky. You can put in other, other terms, derogatory terms. It's absolutely striking. The infamous N-word dwarfs all of these other terms. It is alone uh, in the, uh, the to the degree to which uh, it uh, is uh, uh, is used. People have asked me about uh, you know do you. Do you still lecture on the N-word? Sure, I lecture on the N-word. I, 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 you know, I'm 
I'm, lecture, I'm, I'm essentially lecturing on the N-word right now. I have no problem with talking about the N-word. Um, and most recently, most recently, the, the, um, the, the cases in which I've, I've, I've talked about this word the most have been cases, I've already mentioned, uh, cases in which teachers have been disciplined. I'll mention one last case, and I'll, 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 I'll leave our session with this case. Um, I find it very troubling. There was a case in New York a couple of years ago. Teacher at the new school. This was a course um, on social commentary. And the subject of the class was James Baldwin. And the teacher asked the students whether the, you know, they had seen the documentary, uh, I Am Not Your Negro, documentary about James Baldwin. And um, she asked the students to go to YouTube and see what James Baldwin had said. And what, James Baldwin did not say, I am not your Negro. James Baldwin said, I am not your nigger. And she asked, you know, what do, what do you think? What, what, you know, what's, how do you, what, what, what's your view? What's your assessment of the change made by the filmmaker? What's your assessment of the bowdlerization of James Baldwin? Well, in, the, in, the, in this context, and by the way, this was a white teacher. In this context, at some point, nigger comes out of her mouth. And a student complained about it. And for months, she was under investigation. Uh, she had to, you know, go to the trouble of getting an attorney. There was a whole, you know, long thing about this. And I find this, such, this case so troubling. One, the bowlerization of James Baldwin. In my view, it was a terrible thing for the filmmaker to remake the language of James Baldwin. If you take a look at the clip on YouTube, it's quite clear that he's using the infamous N-word, nigger, advisedly. It wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't some just sort of, it wasn't just uh, some sort of off the cuff meaningless thing. It meant a lot to him. He was doing it on purpose. And then secondly, that this teacher was being investigated in this way seemed to me just um, uh, bad. And of course, we are now in a situation in which teachers all across the country are being investigated and being put under a lot of pressure for trying to grapple with uh, racial affairs in American history and racial affairs today. And it's certainly one of the more troubling features of our social, political, cultural landscape. Um, listen, thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. And again, I would like to thank the Harvard Bookstore for sponsoring this event and events like it. Well, thank you so much, Professor Kennedy, and particularly for your warm words about the bookstore. Um, and thank you to everyone out there for spending your Friday night with us. Um, you can learn more about um, and purchase the book uh, on harvard.com or in the link uh, in the chat. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I hope you all have a wonderful night. Keep reading and please be well. And thank you again. Have thank you. Bye-bye.